Oke, okay. bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Good afternoon everybody. The Honorable, the Secretary of the Department, Associate Professor Bagia Agung Prabowo PhD. The Honorable, our guest speakers. The first is Associate Professor Sony Zulhuda, a senior and Associate Professor from the Islamic University International Malaysia, in Islamic University of Malaysia. And then the Honorable Associate Professor Ji Hyun Park from the School of Law, Yongsan University. The Honorable Associate Professor Dr. Budi Agus Rizwandi from the Faculty of Law, Universitas Islam Indonesia. And also, ladies and gentlemen, from this venue and also from home. This afternoon, we will discuss about the law and development in the era of pandemic. As we already know that in 2020, in the month of February, World Health Organization declared that the COVID-19 spread out the world and every country closed their borders. COVID-19 virus is also affects to the economic of the state. Of course, not only the economic, but also the social, political, culture, and multi-sector in every state in the world. Every government now establishing their own rules how to cope the pandemic. This morning, I really very proud to have our students, not only from Universitas Islam Indonesia, but also from the Islamic International University Malaysia and also other universities in Indonesia. They are presenting their ideas and arguments how the law should govern this pandemic. Right now we have three wonderful speakers. I know that I received their own CV and I deeply know about them. So if I should mention their CV, because their CV is really more than 10 pages and I really know they are very professional. So I just only briefly introduce you. Our first speaker is the associate professor from the Islamic International University of Malaysia. He is Associate Professor Sony Zulhuda. He is now Head of the International Affairs in Abri Abri Ahmad Ibrahim Kuliah of Laws, International Islamic University of Malaysia, and has a deep concern in cyber law and also tort law. Good afternoon, Professor Sony. Good afternoon, Dr. Dodi. Thank you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, very clearly. Yes, now it's clear. So behind the background of Professor Sony Zulhuda <laughs> is the background of the campus of Ahmad Ibrahim Kuliah of Laws. Yes. I, I think that's the central campus of Gomba yes. Campus in International Islamic University of Indonesia. That's true. You, 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 you were there. The situation you were there, there? Right. is it good? Alhamdulillah. We are still on uh, under lockdown, unfortunately. <laughs> 
Okay. It's a rest, uh, limited lockdown. Then we have lockdown, our anyway. second speaker. The second speaker is from South Korea. She is now very active and also building a relationship between Universitas Islam Indonesia and also Yongsan University. She is a associate professor from the School of Law, Yongsan University, and having a specialized in international law and definitely an expert in law in South Korea. So good afternoon, Ms. Professor, Associate Professor Ji Hyun Park. Hello. Yeah. Nyong <laughs> Haseo. Yeah. I can do this, just like South Korea. Like? Yeah. <laughs> Greetings and love from Yogyakarta. Oh, so, uh, welcome to our conference. How was the situation in your country right now? Mm -hmm. Yesterday I went to Seoul and uh, it's a very quiet, <laughs> meaning that people are staying at home. Okay. So then we have our third speaker. He's also quite active and he is an associate professor and soon become the professor full professor in Universitas Islam Indonesia. If you being the member of Facebook of Associate Professor Dr. Budi Agus Rizwandi is quite active in publishing status that he is becoming teachers, speakers, and researchers all around the world, I think. And he is now the head of the study program, Faculty of Law, Universitas Islam Indonesia. And he has a deep concern in intellectual property right law. Right now, he is the, also the chairman or the director of Central Study of Intellectual Property right Law. And I should say hi and good afternoon to Associate Professor Budi. Hello, Pak Budi. Hello, Pak Budi. Agus. Good afternoon. Assalamualaikum. Hello, Pak Budi. Hello, hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah we Do you can hear, hear me? You. Clear? Yeah. We can hear you. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. For everybody. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam. Welcome to the Prof. conference. Prof. Yes, nice Prof. to meet Thank you again. Nice to meet you. Again. Yes. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Greetings from Yogyakarta. Now we will start our discussion today with the conference entitled Law and Development in the Era of Pandemic. It's still hot news, I think. And even in Europe right now, they have second wave. And even in this town, just like yesterday, Daerah Istimewa Yogyakarta or Yogyakarta Special Region is also declared as red zone. So right now we are having a difficult situation. And we will see how is the development of law and how the law could regulate about the economics issue the cultural issues, the political issues in this COVID-19 pandemic situation. So I would like to ask Associate Professor Sonny Zulhuda as the first speaker today to present your wonderful presentation today. So please, you can turn on your microphone and you can do screen share from there. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me, Dr. Dodi? Yeah, clear. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> may I know? May I check with Dr. Dodi how how uh, many yeah. how, how long I would have uh, for the presentation? Twenty minutes, Pak Dodi. Yes, or yes. Twenty minutes. Okay. <laughs> so, perfect. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Alhamdulillahirobbilalamin. Uh, Salatu First of all, I'd like to thank. Uh, Universitas Islam Indonesia, especially Faculty of Law, and uh, under the uh, uh, with all the leadership, uh, the deanship, and all the lecturers involved, uh, especially my very good friend and uh, acquaintance and partner in crime, <laughs> both Dr. Dodi as well as uh, Prof. Budi, inshallah. Thank you for having me. And uh, also, it is a pleasure to meet you, Prof. Park from Korea. 
So it's a great time, a great moment to connect and to network. And uh, certainly all the uh, participants here, I, I believe mostly students from many universities. And I am glad that I was here even before this conference, I was joining the students uh, colloquium where we had beautiful presentations from young people, yeah. So I noticed we have participants, at least from Indonesia and Malaysia, including my students in, uh, in IAUM, and also my students in UEE who were exchange students. Mm. Yeah, all uh, Yuan and, and friends. <laughs> uh, Yuan, uh, I mentioned. Yuan is right here now. Can you raise okay, hand? Okay, great. <laughs> It is good to know. Uh, it's really, it's really a pleasure for me to see you keep on going and uh, doing uh, good things, keeping it up, and of course other friends as well. So I congratulate the uh, organizers in general. So I'm asked to share with uh, the conference here, with the in the colloquium here, and and conference here about. Uh, one uh, issue relating to the legal uh, developments during pandemic, uh, which is on cyber law. So let me now share my screen. Yeah, I believe. Uh, okay, now it should be. Uh, let me know if you can see it now. Okay, can you see it now, uh, Doctor yes. Dendi, or anyone? Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, let me start now about this uh, presentation. Uh, as it was noted by Dr. Dodi, my area of uh, interest and research in the past 10 years, uh, we can say it's been very intensively on the cyber law related issues. Uh, including cyber crimes, data protection, online privacy, electronic commerce, and so on. So uh, whenever you see me talking, uh, I mean, more than uh, 90 percent, uh, I won't be departing from this area because that is what I can do best. And otherwise, I won't be feeling myself qualified to do that. Uh, so in this uh, presentation, let me just do a uh, uh, share uh, some uh, trends yeah? uh, and also uh, thoughts that we can take uh, further uh, in relation to cyber law uh, issues uh, that um, recently uh, yeah, uh, being um, intensified due to the pandemic. And because of this pandemic, of course, not only cyber law issues uh, are of concern, but any other areas of law are actually being um, intensified, being uh, discussed uh, uh, intensively in many ways. Because I was also here in the morning in the colloquium where I saw students, students, our students yes, speak about uh, so many areas and sub uh, subject matters where we, we realize that this <laughs> pandemic uh, does uh, uh, bring forward lots of challenges. And um, we, we don't have to go far to find the reason behind it because the pandemic itself is very disruptive. Yeah? The pandemic itself is very disruptive. I remember I just met uh, Dr. Dodi and uh, Dr. Budi uh, last year. We never had this kind of uh, uh, idea that things will become like this and because of the pandemic. And in a matter of less than one year, the pandemic has um, disrupted a lot of uh, social instruments and social life. And not less uh, disrupted is actually the legal uh, the legal system itself. As you realize, uh, many uh, jurisdictions came up with uh, uh, amending and legislating uh, new laws, yeah? legislating new laws uh, relating to the management of uh, uh, issues due to the pandemic. Um, 
starting from the property law, contract law, and uh, even environmental law, as well as cyber law. So it is really, really disruptive. Uh, but we really come to a very important uh, uh, learning curve here uh, that we are, to some extent, we are... Uh, yeah, I, I hope uh, the, the noise can be uh, managed. Sorry. Uh, yes, I... Hello, Padodi. Padodi, mute. Touch or mute. Sorry, I, I just need to set, sort it out this uh, very quickly, hopefully. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is, uh, uh, I think, the new norm that we really need to go, uh, uh, to go through. Yeah. Okay, let me just do, uh, my presentation is, is quite concise. So what I'm saying is that it is really a challenge to all of us but we are actually coming to a very important learning curve. It is a learning experience for all of us as a legal fraternity members. Either you are a, a professor or you are a student or you are a lawyer or even you are in the judiciary. We really learn something very huge, very massive here. How the law should be able to react very quickly to this very disruptive uh, phenomenon called this COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, this pandemic is not the first time, you know, uh, the humanity has ever experienced, but of course the, the intensity and uh, serious challenges uh, uh, mounting due to the more complexity of life that we are currently have. So um, it is a learning curve for us to really learn how to have a disruptive law at the same time. We, we see a disruption in, in, our, uh, in front of us and how to, man how to react um, um, uh, properly to this disruption is for us to have a, a, a disruptive uh, legal process. Yeah, if we keep on using the 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 traditional way of lawmaking and rulemaking, and uh, most of time we we would not be able to catch up this disruption uh, which comes from time to time. Okay, so this is what I say as a learning curve that we really have to move fast and uh, rethink the way how we make laws, how we interpret laws, and how we uh, are able to, uh, to keep on changing the rules, if need be, of course. Um, and of course, rules keep changing from time to time, but we need to be very uh, prepared uh, in, uh, more intensively. So <clears throat> in my presentation, it is uh, divided into four um, uh, parts. Let me just go to it. Uh, Immediately, uh, first, we are looking at the reality of the pandemic <clears throat> um, that we have now uh, gone through uh, about 10 months, I think by now, or 11 months in some places. So if you look at the reality, it is really massive in a way that it has affected uh, 60 million people uh, all over the world in more than 200 uh, countries and territories. Um, and unfortunately, uh, it has uh, taken the life of 1.4 million. Of course, this is Qadarullah, but this is how you see the, the, the effect and the, 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 the yeah, uh, uh, massive yeah, effect of the pandemic. And it has forced governments worldwide to impose lots of measures, yeah, lockdown, isolations, quarantine order, uh, restricted travel order, and even uh, the cancellation of a uh, lot of, uh, you know, uh, agenda works, meetings, uh, symposiums, summits, and so on. So <clears throat> it is a new norm that all of us, not only governments, are forced to embrace, but even everyone, yeah, everyone as, as, uh, as, uh, as uh, you know, uh, young as uh, my 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 child, uh, eight nine years old, they have to get themselves used to 
sit for a few hours in front of the computers. Um, of course, with some breaks in between, or otherwise it will be a disaster for them uh, for the purpose of online classes. And we all do online you know, uh, shopping, learning, working, and so on, like this webinar as well. This is really a new norm. But, but I don't see it as a problem because a human, uh, as a matter of fact, been uh, going through uh, uh, changes and changing circumstances from time to time. We just need a little time, perhaps little more time to others to get ourselves adapted to it. Our lifestyle now changes because we have to make sure physical distancing and uh, reducing uh, crowd and also controlling our movements and so on. But this is the twist uh, that uh, this situation creates lots of uh, vulnerabilities, be it a social, technical, as well as uh, individual vulnerabilities, because we are all learning, we are all forced to uh, to to, to uh, leave the way that we are not used to. Um, we are forced to, for example, do our works from home with lots of limitations and less uh, uh, technical supports. If you, you can imagine if you are at, at office, if you have any issues with your computers or your network, you are able to get some supports easily, especially in, in, in uh, many organizations and in, in big organizations. They are all there for you all the time to give you advice what to do with uh, your computers, what to do with your data, what to do with your email and so on. So in, at home, at home, these facilities are not always possible. Uh, you are not always able to contact your uh, technical support to check what is going on with my email, what is going on with my computers. And also, People are getting more into uh, shopping without really getting uh, proper advice as to the do's and the don'ts. Uh, so we are, we are entering to this all vulnerable situation. This is an individual and what more about the governments as well as public life as well. So lots of vulnerabilities. And you see, for example, people have to go to, uh, have to, uh, uh, at one time, they were allowed to go to uh, public place, places and then another, the next day they were not allowed. Some students, uh, they were informed you can go back to school, but the following week they, they were told to go back home because the school was uh, closed down. So lots of vulnerabilities because of this. Um, <clears throat> and of course, this is the lockdown. Let me just skip it. So this uh, take further, I mean, lots of efforts for us to respond to be it in uh, public uh, capacity as well as personal capacity. So certainly it will require lots of resources. You know, you cannot simply go it, you know, uh, without knowledge, without support, you know, and without technologies. So all these things really takes uh, the, the toll out of us to learn by doing. You know, you, we make, uh, we make, uh, uh, mistakes and uh, we have to make mistakes in order to get moving otherwise you will not be moving and you are left uh, behind and businesses cannot move and work cannot move so really this is a great challenge for us and alhamdulillah we always have reason to be grateful until now we are alive we are able to proceed with work do it, even though with some limitations but still thank god um now we see, this is where I also, my presentation will be based on the trends that we look at. Yeah, the trend that we see is that there are emerging risks yeah, due to this new norm, right? Um, and uh, for example, due to the intensified use of the computers and online uh, solutions, we, are, we tend to, uh, we, we, we uh, face a situation where there is this uh, data exploitation yeah, from time to time. So uh, the apps that we are using, for example, uh, uh, keep on asking you to, to uh, uh, exchange data because wh whenever you take any online uh, platforms on your mobile phone and uh, you are happy enough because uh, they are free of charge, you don't have to pay a cent for it, for it, just a few clicks and you will get the beautiful applications, whatever application it is in your mobile phone. But uh, always remember that actually it is not free at all. You are actually paying it with your personal information. So the more you are installing any programs, the more you actually 
uh, disclosing your personal data to uh, other people. So the same goes to this, uh, what people call as tracking apps, isn't it? In some countries like Malaysia, like um, Singapore, you know, uh, where people are either required or um, advised, strongly advised to install um, uh, what we call as tracking apps, tracking applications. It is an app by which uh, it will record your movements, record your locations from time to time. And this information will be gathered by the governments in case it is needed for tracking uh, any, you know, the, the spread of the virus and so on. So if anyone is infected, then the government will be able to know for the past one month, for example, where this guy went on and when and uh, who this person uh, met and this all uh, would be made possible by this tracking applications. The issue with this tracking application, of course, the idea is beautiful, especially at this pandemic time, but then a lot of uh, improvements need to be done. Um, speaking about uh, uh, any countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore, uh, we have seen, uh, generally speaking, that these apps will need to be improved in terms of its data protection policies. You know, because uh, there are a lot of issues when you start collecting the data, uh, we are not arguing about the, the, the reason. Yes, the reason is very, is very clear that you want this data because you may need to track people you know, for the purpose of uh, stopping the infection and the spreading of the disease or the viruses. Yeah, but uh, at the same time, there are other, many risks. For example, if the data is uh, not secured properly and it is also subject to um, uh, unverified and unauthorized people accessing to the data. So uh, you may have more problems than a solution in future. And also other risk, another risk uh, at this slide, as you will see is uh, with more people going online to do whatever works that they want, the shopping and so on. So it is uh, the internet now becoming a, a more attractive ground for fraudsters and criminals yeah, to launch their attack. Because uh, these fraudsters, they will always go to the place where they can pray better. Now, if, you, if these people go to markets and malls and public spaces or roads, they don't see people, as what Professor Park was saying and telling us. She went to Seoul yesterday and she didn't see a lot of people. Maybe if I, I went to Kuala Lumpur, the, the city center, also not many people there. People are not, if you are a criminal, <laughs> I'm sorry to say that. If you are a criminal, you want to steal, you want to fraud, uh, cheat people, you are not going to these places anymore because you don't see people. So your choice, your best choice is to go online, isn't it? Because almost everyone is there all the time. Yeah, be it from the, the youngest uh, son, youngest child up to the, the grandfather, <laughs> they are all online for so many reasons. So this uh, really attracts uh, fraudsters. And we realized that in the past months, actually the incidence of cyber fraud has actually intensified. So this is another risk. And then also not to forget the risk of misinformation. Because now we are increasing on increasingly online we don't meet people we don't buy newspaper we don't go out and so the source of information for us is this uh, cyberspace social media you know text messaging services and so on and it is always very very uh, rampant to uh, uh, misinformation because not only it is easy to spread uh, hoaxes by this uh, in this cyberspace and with these devices but also it is most of time too easy or easier to actually broadcast it or forward it to other people and we all do that and sometimes even in my for myself if, even though i put a quite a strict standard in doing it but sometimes i still feel some urge yeah, to spread what i get so this is also an issue so uh, we have other emerging issues uh, such as uh, unsecured platform. If you tell your employees to work at home, so you, you better make sure you also have this uh, security backup. Yeah. Have you ever actually, for example, uh, we all work on mo mobile phone. Do we, do we do scanning for viruses on mobile phone? 
No, we don't do that as often or as serious as what we do to our computers. But the cyber threat or uh, security threat to mobile phone is could be even more serious than uh, the cyber threat on um, computers. So we don't have to be complacent on that and keep on uh, understanding the, the, the risk. Yeah? Now let me move further. So this uh, actually highlighted and summarized what we have said due to the technical vulnerabilities, it provides window for cyber criminals. And also uh, to some extent, it may serious, seriously affect uh, the critical infrastructure protection. For example, we are talking about a, a country uh, where it has uh, some critical infrastructure, which is very much dependent on, on uh, computer systems. So this becomes, if, if this uh, infrastructure uh, being intruded or being disrupted by um, unauthorized uh, uh, users or hackers as people have uh, known it, uh, commonly. So this can uh, lead to a bigger problem. Uh, for example, we have had uh, issues. Uh, let me just show you here. We have had issues in uh, globally uh, countries reporting that their uh, critical infrastructures are being attacked by people. Yeah. In, 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 uh, in the United States, for example, they got this uh, report on ransomware uh, affecting public health system. And public health system is the most important system, especially during the pandemic. So if you really want to cripple any country, you want to attack any country. So the best uh, uh, target for you to do that is attacking the public health system. I mean, I'm not giving idea you know, to, to those who really wanted to do it, but this is the fact, and this is already a trend. As we already, as we also see, similar uh, intrusions uh, happen in uh, Czechs, yeah, in this, in some parts of Europe, which I highlighted here. I have full reports for this, as well as in uh, Ukraine, um, and uh, they they attack critical infrastructures, and we are talking about uh, cyber security attack. Okay, it's not. Uh, physical attack or someone uh, trespass into the building. No, we are talking about uh, the, 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 this cyber uh, information-based uh, attack. And- uh, Sunny, you have- uh... Okay, yeah, I, I get, uh, uh, my time is almost up. Thank you, but uh, inshallah, we'll be finishing very soon. Also, you see in South Korea, it was, uh, sorry, in Taiwan, yeah, in Taiwan, it was uh, highlighted that their energy uh, company was attacked. And now I want to highlight that one that happens in Jakarta, Indonesia, in which uh, if you remember one of the incidents during a important uh, meeting, government meeting in Jakarta, involving some uh, strategic uh, institutions as well as cyber uh, infrastructure institutions, what happened was during their meeting, the meeting was intruded by uh, unauthorized person. So this is just exactly how it may seem, it may sound uh, 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 light, but the impact can be very serious. If you can imagine, you know, a high level officers meeting intruded by someone inside this uh, webinar or in, inside this uh, virtual conference, uh, you, you can imagine that this person would be able to actually uh, get lots of uh, confidential informations um, and uh, doing further attack because of that. So all these are not only possible, it, they are already happening. So this would be uh, my, uh, I think, last substantive slide yeah, for, uh, for the conference today. So many countries already have lots and lots of uh, cyber law related legislation. So this is really the time for us to activate all those laws. And because as I said in the very beginning, we are coming in the disruptive world and the law needs to move fast. This is the time to test our cyber laws. Yeah, we are happy enough, especially in Malaysia, we have been very happy to be saying, to be able to say, we already have cyber laws since 1997. Wow, that is like 13 years ago. Um, so, so what? No, sorry. It's not 13 years ago. It is 20 years, uh, 20, 
three years ago, yeah, that Malaysia already has a cyber law, but but they are not really tested. By tested here, I mean, uh, have we actually effectively enforced it? So the answer is not really. The, the, we, we will see, uh, we haven't seen uh, the law uh, uh, fully enforced or effectively enforced. And uh, this is just the time to activate uh, all those uh, possible laws, including Malaysia, uh, Indonesia. Indonesia has a very strong uh, legislation called Undang-Undang uh, ITE, yeah? Information Transaction Electronic. It includes a lot of, you know, it's because people know in Indonesia, when I mention Undang-Undang ITE, ITE, they only talk about what? They only think about uh, pencemaran nama baik, defamation, about hate speech, ujaran kebencian. That's it. But actually, there are a lot, lot more uh, areas uh, which are regulated under the Undang-Undang ITE. So this is just the time I think governments has to activate these uh, cyber laws and look at all the possible solutions. For example, law against computer misuse, law against cyber fraud, and then law uh, in order to protect uh, consumers during e-commerce because they are shopping online, you know. And also a personal data protection law. Uh, for Indonesia, we need to be patient a little bit uh, because the draft law is still uh, processed in, in the parliament. Maybe hopefully by next year, we can have the law uh, ready or maybe by end of this year, we don't, we don't know, we'll see. So that is my point. Uh, and where to start? We need to strengthen the leadership and governance, enhance social awareness. Everyone should know that cyberspace is not always a peaceful space. And distributed security means everyone must take role, not only the government, the enforcement, but also the end users, as well as the internet um, intermediaries and service providers. Yeah? And we need to uh, enhance public-private partnership all the time, uh, all the time to ensure uh, efficient uh, enforcement of the law, right? That's it, My uh, what I can share with you. Thank you. Uh, and I get back to uh, Dr. Dodi. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. That was a wonderful presentation. I could see yeah. that now uh, the cyber infrastructure face so many challenges. But I think this is the time for every government to activate the cyber law, to modernize the cyber law so that they could protect the sovereignty of the state from the other challenges or any cyber attacks from outside their border. So I think that was a very insightful and wonderful presentation. Thank you, Professor Sony. Thank you. Thank and you. I think we will have second speaker today and our speak, second speaker today is uh, Associate Professor Ji Hyun Park. So please, uh, can you do the screen share, the PowerPoint? Yes, I can see it now. Okay, now uh, everyone can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, uh, was it um, Selamat uh, Selamat Sore and Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Okay. Um, yesterday uh, was a. Uh, uh, I have gone to the Seoul uh, because uh, we had a ceremony for the seventh anniversary of the Korean War. So, um, so from the Minister of, Minister of Defense and also the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs and also the uh, Red Cross, ICRC, International Red Cross has gathered uh, but due to the stage two that the Seoul metropolitan city has to face, the, suddenly the Minister of Defense had uh, uh, canceled their visit. So it was uh, very bad for them to not to participate at that important event. Uh, however, uh, I have uh, shared the information that we successfully now uh, uh, had a, a new law relating to the Red Cross emblem 
to protect the citizen uh, for to use the uh, Red Cross emblem. So it was a very nice of me going there and share the uh, it, uh, it, uh, experience of uh, um, making the law of uh, uh, Red Cross emblem. And also the, uh, the ceremony of the uh, uh, 70th anniversary of the Korean War. Uh, Okay, uh, let me uh, go through the uh, pandemic uh, related law. Here, uh, I took a picture of the uh, um, morning sunshine and uh, it is really nice to see the sun and enjoy the nature. This is how we have lived our life. But since uh, the pandemic had uh, attacked us, we have to change our behavior and also the, the way we act and we uh, the way we talk and we uh, collaborate with each other. Okay, uh, this is the uh, uh, web page of the uh, Korean Disease Control Agency, uh, Control and Prevention Agency, and going to the um, English version of it, they share all the information uh, officially. The reason I'm sharing this uh, the site is that uh, citizens are um, sharing many information. Some are not official, some are official. So mixing the information with the non, uh, not official information give unstable mind of mindset to the citizen. Having this uh, official uh, notice given to the community is very important during the pandemic, okay? So they control all the information through this page. Whoever, whoever they have a, a cell phone or access to the PC, uh, according to the data of uh, Korean statistics, uh, almost 98% of Koreans has computer access. So the information they can get to the uh, COVID-19 is, um, available to almost to almost a uh, citizen okay so here we have uh, they said the social distancing will be raised to level two for so metropolitan area and level 1.5 for honam which is the uh, uh, left lower part of the korean region other places uh, it's a uh, uh, stage one which is uh, uh, just uh, having the social distancing only not need to have a limit the uh, density of the gathering or others. Okay, so, so uh, going to the situation talk, so Seoul uh, has a second stage. Uh, some of the examples I'm sharing here is the restaurants. Uh, after 9 p.m., takeout and delivery is only available option for the person. And wedding and funeral halls under 100% person density is allowed. And certain uh, entertainment facilities with a closer, uh, a closer uh, skinship, then it's all locked down. And Norebang, which is a singing uh, karaoke, close at 9 p.m. That means that everyone has to go home at 9. Before 9, everybody is supposed to be. Uh, Having home, kindergartens are uh, schools are one third density, and also the high school uh, is a two third density. Out of level one to level three, they put uh, level one point five and two point five. Uh, we used to have a level five from level one, but then again, uh, they they have revised the uh, state social distancing. Uh, level to one to uh, five to one to three. So they have uh, a lower the uh, economic effect to the society. Here is an example of Ireland. The reason I'm showing you is that this is a nice uh, infographic that they have made. Uh, so they have uh, good information of how the visitors are uh, how many visitors are allowed at level one, also wedding, indoor events, sports, and bars, uh, web pubs, and domestic travel and public transportation. 
So it is the same in Korea to have uh, all kinds of uh, limitation according to the level one to level three social distancing. Again, here, the structure to respond COVID-19 is important, but then again, it depends on the infection status. If infection is a low, then the social distancing is low and all the activities are almost free. I didn't have any problem going to the department store, having a figure skating and others, but depending on the states, uh, for example, in Seoul, you're al not allowed to have uh, density, too much density in department store. So you're, uh, you have to limit yourself going to the department store. Here, community engagement for the uh, infectious, uh, infection status uh, notice is given daily basis by the government officially. If you have a non-official information given to the society, they, have, they will have uh, so many rumors. So stopping those rumors, they give notice daily basis. Also, uh, we share many news, official news channels. Always there is a, a expert in a disease control sharing the information at that stage, what to do uh, to the citizen, also to the experts and to the hospital. So these are the information matters. Uh, we are getting official information through the channel of the government, also the tr through the channel of the uh, news. Uh, besides sharing the information, they take the government take a precautionary measures, uh, like uh, having all the uh, elderly, they, uh, they check first and they take uh, preventive measures, giving them the medical cares and those uh, uh, testings are given to the elderly first, so they take precautionary measures. Also protecting vulnerable populations such as uh, those who does not have a Wi-Fi, they give a Wi-Fi money for the Wi-Fi. Also rent the tablet PCs for them to study. Uh, also free access to the, uh, I will talk about this later, EBS channel, which is a free, for students to study. So providing uh, social economic support is also important for them. Uh, so I have received about $200 for uh, personal, uh, personal subsidy base because of the pandemic. Also for, from the school, uh, they provide subsidy uh, given by the government also. Uh, in total, I, uh, in my family, Obtained about uh, about uh, 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 thousand, thousand, uh, about two thousand dollars for the subsidy during this pandemic, because uh, social economic support by the government is given to the old citizen who is at a certain uh, requirement. So most of the almost all the uh, Korean citizen has uh, received. Uh, uh, subsidy uh, during the pandemic. Uh, public health capacity here is the also important. So they detect, trace, and expert give notice. Border control is another matter. So for for uh, Korean government to do this, uh, they had made a scheme. It's called the Living with the COVID nineteen scheme. They have uh, uh, revised the level one to level three. And for this, uh, this is how a uh, student take an uh, exam during the uh, uh, pandemic, social distancing, also taking the exam here. And this is the subsidy I have talked about it. And here it says per person, $100. So uh, I have received twice and Third uh, disaster uh, subsidy is coming soon. So economic response financial risk package for citizens is available to everyone. 
disease, uh, disaster damage support fund is uh, allotted by the parliament and given to the all citizen. Depends on the city, one needs amount of sub city, subsidy is uh, different. Uh, and then ready for the uh, third subsidy to come. Okay, so for the businesses, uh, economic response financial rest package for the businesses are also available. The first case that Korea had uh, the COVID-19 patient is uh, January 20th. And then uh, uh, right after the first patient uh, has been found, uh, parliament had gathered to respond to the COVID-19 to have uh, right away the financial stimulus package. Otherwise, it cannot, everybody uh, knew the economic will go down. So income support, debt and the contract relief for household and fiscal measures for the business and international support is also available to uh, international companies uh, outside. Uh, the, those are the important matters. Here says uh, 45.5 uh, billion for financial support for businesses and 60, 16 billion for bond markets stabilization fund has been uh, passed the bill. Uh, uh, of the parliament. So that was uh, March, okay? And also the tax relief and subsidy. Uh, here are all the tax relief given to the business. This law has passed March 23rd. So within uh, two months, parliament had worked to give a boost to the uh, society or subsidize all the people who, ha got, who has been uh, affected. Here, the health system support has given to the citizen all free, uh, not only the information, because information is a weapon to fight against the, uh, the risk. And uh, when they have information, they have no fear. When they don't have information, they fear. So uh, information matter they share, testing policy they share, also test is free. So these are the uh, all uh, health system, they made us uh, feel safe, okay? So these are also supposed to be supported by the uh, uh, law. Uh, I will share the information, uh, how many bills has been uh, 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 introduced by the parliament in two months. You know, the, can you guess how many bills are introduced within two months after the pandemic? It's a 300 bills. So all the parliament members, that means that all the parliament members, they made one uh, bills per person. So they, had, uh, they have acted really uh, actively to solve the problem of COVID-19. And the reason I'm sharing this, uh, uh, the screen, is these are all information and diagnostic uh, application is uh, free to download. And you can check yourself whether you have a symptom similar to COVID-19 compared to uh, any other flus. Uh, if you don't have these apps, you, be, uh, uh, you will have a fear that your symptom is, uh, Maybe COVID, maybe flu. So they have provided all the information, uh, di diagnostic information that you can check whether you have a COVID or not. So here, uh, this is called the digital resilience. Those who does not have uh, um, access to the full information, they will have a problem. So having this application free, open to the public is really important. Diagonals, and this is a 1993. Any, any question you have relating to the COVID, you are open. They are open, okay? And also here, okay, 
So the uh, the law has passed here the March in March fourth of the twenty twenty. Uh, the, what we had at the first stage of the COVID was that everybody needed a, a facial covering. We need a mask. Then uh, some of them, they just had a stack the mask as sort of very uh, high price. So they, the first thing they had to do is passing the law to control the price of a mask. And then they had to make the people to test uh, whether they have a COVID or not. So they have to force the person to take a test. They have to change the law to make them to take a test. So here they push the law of a police action scope has been expanded to suspected infectees. So it used to be just infected, but now uh, suspected infected. So those uh, suspected infected person are supposed to take a test uh, if you are not taking the test, even you ha uh, when you have a symptom, you are going to be fined for not reporting it properly. If you lie, there is a one guy who lied where uh, he had a teaching student uh, at the institution. Then he had a one year uh, jail term for lying it because because of him, there are like uh, uh, more than 50 people got infected after him. So not only the penalty, also the imprisonment is open to those people. Okay, so these are the uh, March 4th, they have passed this law. And for the Equal Employment Opportunity and Work Family Balance Assistance Act, this is to support the uh, family because the family care vacation should be available for those uh, who, sh uh, who should uh, take care of students, uh, babies. Uh, it used to be uh, just uh, three to 10 days. Now 20 days, single parents, 25 days, non-paying vacation is possible for parents as well as the grandparents. Uh, it used to be 10 days, but then again, you have you can make your excuse of uh, vacation uh, due to the uh, COVID-19. You can tell your owner, a business owner that I have to take care of my baby. So uh, let me go to the free uh, uh, non-paying vacation. It's uh, illegal. So um, this is also important. Otherwise uh, you, you don't get paid and also you get fired. So this is a new bill that uh, has passed uh, because the pass of the law uh, or this uh, drive-through uh, action of a check-in was possible because of the illegal practice of uh, uh, medical uh, uh, field is a very serious crime in Korea. So having this or this possible is uh, after changing the laws. Uh, this is a, a treatment center, those uh, coming from the abroad. Uh, these are facilities, uh, they are given to those people who are uh, arriving at the airport. Uh, some are, uh, it used to be all free, but then again, there are too many, uh, uh, too many um, money, uh, tax money has been spent. So uh, the, now uh, they have to, uh, anybody who stays here, they have to pay. Okay, this is uh, the guideline for the uh, treatment center and the level of the uh, um, threat, depending on the level of the threat, uh, the government reaction is uh, different. And this is how the uh, information and also the policy making uh, uh, is given from the president to the cities. Uh, we are open to the uh, information at what stage the policy has been decided. Also, the investigation system. Excuse me, Professor Park. Yeah. You yeah. still have five minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this investigation system is uh, very important unless uh, you have uh, this uh, official uh, law passed, you don't have to cooperate. So after this uh, uh, investigation uh, 
uh, law has been passed. This, if you have a symptom and then you got the notice that you got infected, you receive notice of isolation and this is the form that official form you receive. So you can expect what will be after you get infected also. So Central Disease Control Headquarters, the uh, Ministry of Justice share the information. Here are the, the reason why I'm sharing this one is that how they track down, we are all curious. So uh, they let us know the Minister of Justice is uh, controlling all this data and has insurance review and assessment service. That means that any of the prior symptom uh, before you got infected, they all know. So they link your health matters to the current situation and they track down telecommunication companies or so the credit card uh, companies, they GPS, they uh, take everything and know where you've been and uh, share information to the citizen nearby. So who decides uh, this tracking is important and necessary? And tracking starts with the necessity decided by the municipal epidemic service officer. So we know who decides it and request by whom, who decides and who de uh, whom uh, it will request and how they request everything is according to the uh, law and infectious disease control prevention law, I IDCPA is there. Okay, and scope of disclosure and what kind of information will be disclosed. Uh, it is all open at the article two of 13 of that law, same law. Okay, these are the new, uh, the, the revised version of the law. It, it was there, but it is all revised due to the COVID-19. So here, for relating to the disclosure information to infectious disease emergency, now here, uh, these are the information you will be disclosed. And also, um, you can file objection uh, if uh, actual fact is uh, different from what they have disclosed. Uh, you have a uh, application to file objection to. So this is also important because we are living in a democratic society. And wherever you go, you will see this uh, QR and you can just have uh, your QR code pass in and you will see the clock and you have to write down. If you don't have a, a QR code, you write, your, write down what time you are in and you use glove and sanitizer, write down and you can, this uh, personal information is shared in one year. Okay, so these are the, uh, uh, the, uh, the laws uh, for the, uh, uh, that uh, control the, uh, the society and base the action of the government. And I'd like to point out one more thing that is a proactive administration before lawmaking, as uh, Sunni Juhuda uh, professor said, that making law takes a long time. So another measure we have taken is a proactive administration. Before we make the law, uh, the government take action. And then they, they made a special committee, which is called the proactive administration committee. Once they think that this measure is unnecessary, we pass it to, uh, uh, to the action and then later they make a law. Uh, first, safety of citizens. Second is the digital resilience and deduction of business expense and subsidy. Three matters this committee passes without the uh, law. Okay, here you get all the uh, uh, free information and free education through the government site, which is called EBS. A digital resilience and personal information dilemma is very important to uh, uh, people to get educated during the COVID-19. So they opened the free, uh, free uh, this is already existed uh, channel, but they opened the free and they even provide the data money for the uh, student. So for university, we have to have uh, the rules for the university has been also changed. Uh, only 20% online class was the ceiling for 
the graduation, 80% uh, any of the university with a normal uh, set, we are not allowed to have a more than 20% of online class. Now it is all gone. You can have 100% online class. It is okay for you to have a degree. And one hour is uh, equal to 25 minutes in minute of online class here. And also attendance checking is the changes. And these are the, uh, the pages that uh, we share. LMS is all uh, given by the university. Otherwise you have to buy your own Zoom account. So the university has to uh, provide all. Okay, so this is COVID resilient ranking, um, but don't need to have it. So this is the, the thing. So having said that law is important, but second thing is a proactive uh, administration methods taken by the government is also important. And third one is individual action of wearing the facial covering. Here is a second line of the Seoul Metropolitan Subway. Everybody wears it and everybody holds it. So they are all safe there. Uh, when they wear masks. So during the pandemic, we need a lot proactive on administration and face mask. Okay, so this is my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Park. Wow, that's really wonderful presentation. I could, I think I write down notes more than two pages. Ah. <laughs> yeah. So South Korea has very robust system to mitigate and prevent the COVID-19 virus. And uh, in terms of economic, the government provides the subsidies and also all sector in South Korea shall coming together in unity. I think this is a good example. The law is important as Professor Park mentioned. They have a very detailed regulation, the Infectious Disease Control and Prevention Act. I think the Indonesia should also learn from South Korea and how to regulate uh, the COVID-19 and to mitigate and to prevent the COVID-19. And the government proactive administration is also important. And we see that the individuals in South Korea, they have a very diligent and very different culture. So they support each other. So. Uh, it's not only from the government, the law, but also from the member of the society. So I think this is a good example. We learned many things from South Korea. Thank you, Professor Park. You, and now Prof. we turn to the next speaker, Associate Professor Dr. Budi Agus Rizwandi. Okay. okay. I will share screen. Yes. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much to Prof. Dodi because uh, you have inviting me in this International Student Colloquium 2020. So today. I will presentation about flexibility in Indonesia patent system for the use of the COVID-19 vaccine. What's the solution? For this presentation, I have three subtopic issue, namely first about flexibility in TRIPS agreement. And the second, what are the opportunity for the utilization of Corona-19 vaccine through flexibility in the Indonesian patent system. And the third, of course, it is my uh, last presentation. I will make uh, some conclusion from my presentation. First, I, I will talk about flexibility in the TRIPS agreement. What is the TRIPS agreement? TRIPS agreement is one of the multilateral agreement in the field of international trade re relating to intellectual property rights. TRIPS agreement 
is an ethic integral part of the agreement to establish World Trade Organization that was founded in Marrakesh in 1994. The TRIPS agreement is one of the most strategic international legal instruments currently in the field of international trade. The strategic value of the TRIPS agreement today with regarding to issue of intellectual property rights and public health. TRIPS agreement creates minimum standard of intellectual property protection and allow member state to determine how to implement TRIPS requirement into their own law by providing that members shall be free to determine the appropriate method of implementing the provision of this agreement within their own legal system and practices. And then TRIPS agreement have the objective. Maybe everybody can see in my screen. Uh, this is uh, the objective of TRIPS agreement. According Article 7, the objective of TRIPS agreement is the protection and enforcement of intellectual property rights should contribute to the promotion of technological innovation and to the transfer and dissemination of technology to the mutual advantage of producer and user of technology knowledge and in a manner conducive to social and economic welfare and to a balance of right and obligation. If we see Article 7 3 Agreement, Article 7 clarified the intent of drafter to balance to the mutual advantage of producer and user, the need to establish incentive for creation and promotion of new technology without unduly restricting the, dis the dissemination of the technology once created. Thus, the very essence of the innovation access debate is crystallization in the term of Article 7 of the TRIPS agreement itself, with WTO members argue to find balance. The balance is currently reflected in the TRIPS agreement itself, with its combination of obligation and exception. One of exception in TRIPS agreement, we can see in Article 8.1 TRIPS agreement, According Article 8.1 TRIPS Agreement stated, member may in formulating or amending their laws and regulation, adopt measures necessary to protect public health and nutrition, and to promote the public interest in sector of vital importance to their social, economic, and technology development, provided that such measure are consistent with the provision of this agreement. Importantly, Article 8.1 conclude that any measure to protect public health and nutrition or to promote the public interest must be consistent with the provision of TRIPS agreement. The use of the word necessary in the process necessary to protect public health and nutrition indicates that it is imperative to consider, consider whether a measure achieves the legitimate objective of protecting public health and whether they may be reasonably available. Less intellectual property restrictive alternative for achieving that same objective. The Doha Declaration further articulate the relationship between the TRIPS agreement and public health. The declaration which affirmed that the TRIPS agreement can and should be interpreted 
and implemented in a manner supportive of WTO member, right to protect public health, and in particular, to promote access to medicine for all, was adopted by WTO Ministerial Conference of 2001 in Doha, Qatar. Now, let's the focus to flexibility in TRIPS agreement. If we analyze TRIPS agreement, we can find so many flexibility over there. But in here, I would like to deliver some information about flexibility in TRIPS agreement. They are first, parallel import, second, compulsory licensing, the third, government use, and the last, Number four, public order and morality. What is the meaning about flexibility uh, mentioning? Parallel import is importing and reselling into a country without permission or approval from the patent holder of a product which is still protected by a patent and the product has been entered into the market of the exporting country by the patent holder or the party obtaining right from the patent holder in trips parallel import are regulated in Article 6. A compulsory license is regulated by trips in Article 31. In that article, the use of patent by another party without permission is permitted in the use of the patent made various requirements from the initial application process for implementing the patent to the provision of adequate compensation like royalty to the patent holder. Compulsory license is a government action to allow a company, government representative or other party to use a patent without the consent or consent of the patent holder. The use of patent by the government is also permitted by the trips of the provision contained in Article 31. This article allow WTO member to use patent without permission from the patent holder in certain condition relating to public interest. The use of patent by the government is a decision that allow the government to produce certain patent or need by patent holder for the purpose of national defense and security and for urgent situation in the field of public health. So public order or morality here, the meaning is including public interest and also public health. The public interest is an integral, integral element of governmental regulation, regulatory intervention policy. Carlos Correa opinion that public interest could justify governmental action to achieve public policy objective of promoting health, education, and social economic development. It is the other subtopic, the second subtopic from me. What are the opportunities for the utilization of Corona-19 vaccine, the flexibility in the Indonesian patent system? For explanation about it, I will start from Indonesian patent conception. There are five elements in patent conception in Indonesia, including first exclusive right and the second granted by state and the third technology invention for carry out on invention or give approval to other to carry out the invention and the five for a certain period of time. Let's understanding its element here. Exclusive right, that means patent is legal right that consists of two types of right. Namely, first, the right to exercise by themselves or with a license from the patent holder. And the second, the right to prohibit other parties from using, such as making, selling, importing, and etc. Granted by state, that means 
to obtain a patent as legal right, it must go to an application to the state. Furthermore, if the application is deemed appropriate, the state will grant legal right, call it patent. Visibility of patented technology invention include novelty, inventive step, and industrial applicable. Technological invention, that means technology, technological invention can be in the form of product such as tool, composition, and slash or process, such as process or methods. Carry out on invention or give approval to others to carry out the invention that mean patent holder can implement their own invention that have been discovered and are protected by patent or given permission other parties to implement invention that have been found and we protected by patent. This aspect is a legal obligation on it by patent holder. So the patent, that patent should be implemented and st not stop just obtain a patent certificate. For a certain period of time, that means patent as exclusive right are granted for only a few years. For simple patent, 10 years from the filing date, whereas patent are granted 20 years from the filing date. Patent cannot be renewed when the patent granting period period expire. The patent become the public domain. From this conception, we will examine we will examine how the Indonesian patent system is related to the issue of the spread of COVID-19. Before explaining this connection, we will describe the situation of COVID-19 in Indonesia. The spread of COVID-19 to the dead has spread widely in 34 provinces in Indonesia. The epicenter of COVID is still in Java, especially in Jakarta. From the data presented by the Committee for Handling COVID and National Economic Recovery, there were 522.5 I1 confirmed with detail of uh, 60 uh, I.604 active cases, 467.456 recovery, and one six point five to one die. With this condition, the potential to continue to experience in an increase in the spread of COVID-19 will continue to occur. This is because until today, a vaccine has not been found that can kill the COVID-19 virus. Currently, scientists are doing a lot of research to able to find a COVID vaccine. In 2021, it is hoped that a COVID vaccine can be found to prevent the spread of COVID-19. If the COVID-19 vaccine invention in 2021 is successful, then the vaccine will be subject to patent protection by the inventor by registering it a patent office. With this condition, if there is another party that want to produce the vaccine, it must license the patent holder. As a consequence of license to the patent holder, we call licensor, the party who will produce it, the licensee, must pay royalty. The amount of royalty paid by the party that will produce license recipient is based on agreement between two parties. Excuse me, Prof. Budi, you All have right. five minutes. Okay, I think it's enough. As a further, as a further consequence, the price that is potentially expensive. This is what is par with 13 the safety of mankind 
during the COVID-19 pandemic, including the street that will also be half Indonesian affected by COVID-19. One, on the basis of this, the question is whether there is no state policy that can be used to prevent the price of the COVID-19 vaccine from being inexpensive and un even unpaid to answer this one of which related to the Indonesian patent policy as stipulated in law number 13, 2016 concerning patent. Is there a patent policy in Indonesia to answer this? Let's see. Indonesia has a patent law, namely law number 13 of 2016. If we study the provision of law number 13 of 26, this law has provided several instruments regarding flexibility relating to the implementation of patent. Several instruments that can be identified are first, compulsory license, and the second, use of patent by the government, and the third, parallel import. So I will move to next uh, slide. Actually, if we learn about uh, flexibility in Indonesian patent legal system, have some weakness. What kind, the some weakness, the first external uh, aspect and the second ex, uh, external aspect. Uh, I'm sorry, the first internal aspect and the second external aspect. What kind, the internal uh, aspect internal aspect like uh, human resources and capacity and funding and so on and so on. So the external aspect, we can uh, see like uh, pressure in the other country. It, it means like US, maybe US if uh, find uh, Corona-19 vaccine, so they will uh, push Indonesia must be licensed to the uh, America. So what is the solution from here? Solution from here, I want to give some information. By understanding this weakness in the implementation of the use of the Corona-19 vaccine, the, the flexibility of Indonesian patent, it can be as captaining that if Indonesia only plays it one role, this will be difficult to realize. They are quite open opportunities related to the implementation of patent on the COVID-19 vaccine. So that it can be obtained easily and at low price. So Indonesia should cooperate with other countries to actively carry out diplomacy regarding proposal or support proposal by other countries or a global consensus. This action is justified in according with the provision Article 71 uh, TRIPS uh, Agreement. For the last presentation, I would like to make a conclusion. I have three conclusions from my presentation. The conclusion are, first, the TRIPS Agreement has some flexibility in exercise intellectual property right, including patent. And the second, the Indonesian patent law has flexible instrument as set out in the TRIPS agreement. However, for its implementation, there are obstacles, both internally and externally. And the third, the solution is that Indonesia must immediately undertake diplomacy and legal import by preparing proposal or support proposal by other countries. Well, this proposal must certainly benefit the public health interest of the Indonesian nation. Though this proposal, it can be used as a global consensus, though the TRIPS Council, so that it can be legally binding. Thank you very much, Prof. Dodi. I give my time to you. Thank you very much. Professor Budi Agus Rizwandi, I think uh, this is a hot topic right now because every countries, even every companies, they are doing competition to produce the vaccine of COVID-19. 
right now the issue how to make mass production of vaccine of COVID-19 becoming a uh, hot topic as well and every country have increasing demand of the vaccine. And Professor Budi mentioned that the law of Indonesian patent system is very is actually very flexible. However, they are facing internal and external obstacles. So the government should aware of this, and there should be uh, there should be uh, administrative standards from the government to uh, provide solutions for this issue. So thank you for Prof. Uh, Budi Agus Riswandi, Professor Ji Hyun Park, and also Professor Sonny Zulhuda. Uh, we are now turning to the Q&A session. I would like to provide the students or the participants to provide questions. Uh, you can do using the raise hand and I will give you the opportunity to speak directly to the speaker. And also, uh, please open your camera and mention your name and your original institution. So, I think we yes, have now. I have a question. Okay, you want? Yes, sir. I have a question. Okay, please mention your name, your institution, and your question. Yes. Uh, all right, thank you for Mr. Dorik as a moderator. Uh, my name is Yuan uh, from Universitas of Islam Indonesia, Islamic Community of Islam Indonesia. I have questions uh, directly for uh, Professor Sony Zulhuda. Hello, Prof. It's me, Yuan, Prof. Um, so, yeah, Yuan, yes. good to see you again. Yes, Professor. Thank you. Uh, so my question, Professor, uh, is about the exploitation of cyber infrastructure that you already explained before in your on your slide. So uh, before uh, your presentations, you, uh, your, your your presentation, I present my material uh, as a competitor in this conference regarding artificial intelligence, Professor. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we connect, if we connect. Uh, the connection between the relation between exploitation of cyber infrastructure with artificial intelligence existence right now, that whether the existence or the applications of artificial intelligence into uh, the, cyber, the cyber infrastructure will solve the problem of exploitation, Professor. Uh, very interesting. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Should I now uh, answer, Dr. Dodi? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, uh, artificial intelligence, just like any other technology, uh, depends on what it is designed for and how it is being used. So the AI can be a very powerful tool for cyber attacks or cyber criminals to be able to intrude into the system without some level of human intervention. But at the same time, the use of artificial intelligence can also be exploited by law enforcement, I believe. And it is already to some extent working and operating. Uh, for example, in helping the identifications, yeah? the identifications such as the use of facial, facial recognition technologies with the combination of machine learning as well as the huge database will equip any artificial intelligence tools to be able to not only respond to attacks or like cyber attacks, but also to prevent. Yeah? So it is able, yeah? machine learning is able to uh, just do a predictive analysis. Predictive analysis means somehow able to know what can happen. Of course, not by forecasting out of nowhere, but 
by having more and more data, um, we are able to predict yeah, the what what can what, what may happen given the learning of the human behavior. So if this is equipped into the artificial intelligence technologies, I think it will be a very fantastic tool yeah, to both prevent and respond to cyber attacks. So this is, of course, a general theoretical conception. So it goes down to how the technologists put the solutions as well as uh, streamlining it with the legal and regulatory uh, requirements. So answer to that is absolute, absolutely yes. It can help the law enforcement to deal with the issues of cyber attacks, including the attack to critical information infrastructure. That's it, yeah? Thank you, Yuan, good, good question. You are looking good with that suit and, and tie and all that. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Sonny and Yuan. Is there any question okay. from the participant? Please use the, uh, the button of uh, raise hand, the special button, and we will provide you an opportunity to raise your question. Yes, Farhan. Uh, I will, yes. Can you unmute yourself? Okay, good. Okay, I want to ask uh, how is the urgency and law development regarding patent during the pandemic? Can, can you explain loudly and open your camera? I want to ask about how is the urgency and law development regarding patent during the pandemic? Pardon? How is the urgency and law development regarding patent during the pandemic? The patent? Yes. Okay, so the urgency during the pandemic. The patent during the pandemic. So I think this question is addressed to Professor Budi. How is the urgency of the patent law in the pandemic situation? Okay, thank you very much for the question, uh, Parham. Uh, what is the urgency of patent system in the era of pandemic? It is very important and the strategy. Why? Because the patent system support to the implementation of invention that has been granted a patent, okay? So uh, if you want to implement a, uh, an invention, we must be licensed to the patent, uh, the, to the patent holder. But if we license to the patent holder, it is not easy to take a license because uh, sometimes patent holder give a uh, high uh, or not not high, give uh, expensive royalty. So for this, we need some policy from the government how to implementing of invention that has been granted a patent, like compulsory license, uh, government use, and uh, parallel import. It is. Uh, problem solving for the implementation of uh, invention from legal patent system. Do you understand? Yes, sir. I understand. Can you got point? Can, can you got point? Yes, I get a point, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Pudi. So we also, I think, should have another one question from the participant. Uh, is there any participant who would like? Okay, Julio, please unmute. Yes. Yes, thank you to moderator, Mr. Georgi. I would like to ask a question directly to Mrs. Ji Yun Park. Hello, Professor. <laughs> well, it's uh, a small reunion. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> because me, Mr. Yulio Iqbal is the job yeah. degree program student from PE yeah. sent to Yongsan University. Thank you for the introduction. Yes. So, professors, the thing that maybe I would like to ask to Professor Ji Hyun is uh, how Korea effectively integrated between the society and the law. I still remember until today that uh, professor is always recommended me, if you want to learn some law in Korea, learn the people too. Now, I want to ask that how the Korea is and, you know, integrated nearly perfectly between the law and the society. Thank you. Uh, please unmute. Yeah, you are yeah. asking a, a high quality question, Julio. <laughs> you have to know the law as well as the uh, mindset of the society uh, here. Uh, as I uh, show you, the last page of the presentation was uh, people wearing the mask without the individual corporate collaboration and uh, cooperation to the policy, uh, government policy never works. So individual has to cooperate with the uh, uh, government policy and they have to deeply understand uh, the reason why they are doing it. And Korea used to be uh, very good at controlling the crisis. Whenever we had a problem with uh, uh, at the uh, world level, we uh, engaged in uh, actively. For example, uh, individual had uh, given the gold, personal gold, you know, their asset to the government to, to solve the problem of the uh, IMF status. So having said that Korean people had uh, uh, good uh, cooperation uh, to uh, tackle the uh, COVID-19 with the government policy. Okay, good. I think I have question for, for you, Professor Park. I think uh, your presentation interact me to provide question. Uh, your country provide a very high technology to mitigate the movement of people and also to uh, get more data uh, to know the spread of COVID-19. And it can be accessed from mobile phone, your computer, even with internet. Then compared to Indonesia, we do not have the robust system of technology. Will the government of South Korea protect this system? And will also the South Korea share the system to the other countries or will sell it to a very expensive uh, price to the other country? Because right now, every country has different system, different human resources, different uh, technology capacity. So what do you think? What the Koreans right now doing? Oh, uh, the... After pandemic, actually, the Indonesian uh, government opened the uh, factory for uh, the Korean companies in Indonesia to make the uh, suit for the medical personnel. And uh, that was a good collaboration between Indonesian government and Korean government. From that movement, also the Korean government shared the uh, uh, medical uh, medical supplies to uh, Indonesian uh, hospitals. So that was the good start of uh, two countries' collaboration. Also, the uh, digital resilience, having uh, Korea has 5G uh, uh, connection so far, but for any necessity, uh, there will be the company who will help. For example, Korea at first had a problem of uh, making masks. And what, what, what happened was that the biggest company in Korea, Samsung, they sent their uh, technical personnel and also the person uh, with the strategy 
uh, sent to the uh, small and business companies who is manufacturing masks. They changed and also donated the facility for the small, small and medium companies. That is how the mask production has increased dramatically in a short month. And so, so the small company and medium company was helped by the biggest company in Korea. And also the two countries collaboration will open the uh, uh, more um, uh, help and understanding of each other. And that, that matter also vaccination, uh, Korea uh, companies like uh, the, uh, the uh, Blue uh, Cross and also the uh, uh, Celetron, Celetron, uh, they are making the first uh, cure medicine, uh, as I know, uh, it is almost over the, at the third, uh, third uh, clinical stage for uh, passing the medicine. So we share all the, uh, the medicines, as I know, because uh, AstraZeneca, we uh, Koreans has bought it at the cheapest price for us, uh, uh, at least uh, two thirds of Korean population so far. So most of the uh, Koreans will be uh, getting a vaccine at that time. And we also share the uh, uh, collaboration with uh, Indonesia, as I know. Okay, thank you, Professor Park. Um, I think there is also one participant from Australia. He, she wants to raise question. Uh, Francis, are you there? Can you unmute? Hello, Francis. Wait. Hello, can you unmute? Francis? Hello, can you Hello. hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay, thank you very much. I have a question for... Um, Ms. Jihoon Park, uh, thank you very much for your very informative presentation. I was very interested to see that you used a slide from my national country, which is Ireland. Very good to see our information being used. Um, Ms. Park, there have been a lot of laws passed very quickly in Korea. 300 seems like a huge amount of laws. Many of these laws seem restrictive and intrusive. For example, having access to personal phone records and credit, trans credit card transactions as part of your contract tracing seems to me to be very intrusive. Has there been a backlash from the public in Korea? Do people have concerns about the impact of the new laws on their personal freedom? Uh, please unmute. Yes. Thank you, Francis. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having uh, such a good info uh, graphics so I can share the uh, island uh, graphics with uh, everyone here. Um, Yes, uh, personal data used by the government is uh, such an intrusive way of handling the situation. Uh, at the same time, uh, everyone understands the sharing the information gives uh, uh, the stable situation to everyone's mindset. So fear for the data, fear for the uh, death, if you compare two things, rather not die, than giving the information. It's a choice uh, of the Korean people now. So when you uh, need to give a QR code to the restaurant, whenever you go into the restaurant, you have to pass the QR code uh, stage. Then if you don't want to, you don't have to go. So those people who don't want to give personal data, they have choice going to the traditional market. They don't require them to uh, give a uh, uh, QR code. So small businesses is allowed 
to not have a QR code if they have a big uh, space and small business. So uh, depending on the density uh, you are getting into, you don't have to give a QR code or you have to give the QR code. But the, the core question that uh, you are asking is whether Koreans are fearful the, uh, uh, the use of the uh, personal data, right? So yeah, so they, they made the law, which is that the government will use the uh, personal data according to the procedure that procedure is also open to the public. We know where they are going to use, when they are going to use, what scope of the uh, information that we're going to use. If the information is not correct, you can also file an application of objection and you get compensated also. So those are the some of the relief, but some people don't like it. They don't go to the places sharing the QR code. Thank you. I think there is one more question, but he's addressing privately to my chat room. Oh yeah, Pak Budi Wijaya, please you can unmute yourself. Okay. Yes. Uh, first of all, I... hello, can you hear my voice? Yes, yes, we can hear okay, you, Pak Budi, please. Okay, first of all, it's been a while since the last time I used English. Communication is faster than my language. Please, no problem. Your English <laughs> is good now. Okay. Um, actually, what I'd like to know is from Miss uh, Miss what is it? Miss Korea, North Korea. What was the date? South Korea, not Korea. South Korea. Oh, sorry, South <laughs> Korea. Sorry, yeah. Miss Miss. Um, I don't forget the name. And also, Professor from the Malaysia. From Malaysia. Professor Sony. Professor Sony. What I want to know is, um, according to my experience as a lawyer, during the pandemic time, uh, there are two in Indonesia. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about the situation in Indonesia. There are two types of crimes that increasing, uh, highly increasing. Drugs and cybercrime. Basically for the cybercrime, I found some facts that the CID, Criminal Investigation Department of Cybercrime, for me it's like having some hesitation to move forward to capture the suspect because of the situation. And this situation is getting worse when the, uh, the superior at Mabes Pori also issued some letters that forbid uh, the officers to use uh, what is it uh, like uh, capturing capturing the suspect and then this um, police uh, police. What do you call that? Police, police, police action because of the pandemic. What I want to know is what is it the situation in the country in, in South Korea and in Malaysia? Because I need this information. Who knows? I can use this, this information to motivate my friends in police department to do the same way. If you are better than us in doing this, in uh, you know, in doing this case. Thank you. That would be all. And pardon my reply, just okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Budi Wijaya. Uh, Pak Sony, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay, okay. Uh, I think Pak Sony, you can answer the question first, then uh, yeah, Professor Chihyun Par. Pak, question was from Pak Budi, yeah? Yes. Also, so a lecturer in the faculty, I guess. Uh, no, this is Pak Budi Wijaya. He is the student uh, of the Master of Law ah, and also a lawyer. student and lawyer, mashallah. He is my friend. <laughs> yeah, the same okay. name. Same we, name. Went to, we went to law faculty together with Professor Budi. Okay. okay. 
but but I can somehow I can identify from your voice how authoritative the person is, uh, <laughs> and it just suits you that you are a lawyer. At least with your voice, you can <laughs> uh, enforce something. Okay, uh, let me just. Uh, uh, we do have in Malaysia, we have the similar trend that law enforcement is very busy preoccupied with everything relating to pandemic especially because the lockdown measures isolations quarantine and everything are still still going on so i i i, I met uh, one of our former student who is also in the police department in the police of malaysia he related to me that nowadays police is busy with this <laughs> i mean this is a, of course general statement it is a general statement so polices are uh, doing the roadblocks you know uh, checking people so there is this tendency that other departments are getting lesser exposure and in fact having a slower rate of work yeah so we do not really hear lots of uh, cases of late relating to computer misuse as such however uh, however this cyber crime uh, department at the police diraja malaysia the pdrm is still actively um enforcing law against misinformation or the spreading of hoaxes misinformation and so on police is not alone in 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 this jurisdiction the police is coordinating with another another agency called uh, Com uh, communication and multimedia commission so the spreading of hoaxes and misinformation is very very rampant nowadays including fake news for two reasons reason number one is because of the pandemic you know because of pandemic people tend to spread a lot of things oh you just eat warm water you can be cured from covid then somebody else say that you must go out and get the sun sun apa uh, sinar matahari eh? uh, sun bathing within certain time this is all most of them are fake news <laughs> But uh, the police and the MCMC are quite active in, number one, in uh, warning people not to spread uh, messages like this. But also at the same time, we have lots of uh, cases going up to the court. I didn't mention yet the reason number two. Reason number one is pandemic. Reason number two is, as you may have heard, in Malaysia, just at the same time where pandemic started, somewhere in February and, and March, Malaysia also is going through some political tensions, political um, uh, changes. We have had uh, three uh, prime ministers within this year. Yeah, three here means uh, two same people. Why? Because the first time it was under Tun Mahathir's uh, government. Then he resigned. Then after he resigned, he was appointed as a temporary prime minister. So we con consider as the second term of the prime ministership this within this year. And now the third, we have someone who replaced him. And God knows if we still have like more than one month to see if there is any new prime minister coming in because it is still moving on. So within this kind of political uncertainty, you realize that there are so many misinformations, hoaxes, fake news, and so on. So police is quite active on this, but not on the issue of cyber threat, cyber, you know, cyber uh, hackers, and so on. It, it's always uh, very, uh, it is slow. Yeah. So that is my comment yeah, for, for Bapak uh, Budi. Thank you. Salam kenal, yeah, Pak Budi. Thank you. Salam kenal, Prof. Yes, yeah. yes. Professor Park, please. Uh, I thought uh, uh, Budi uh, is asking question to <laughs> uh, Professor Sony. So uh, the to make sure the question is correct, uh, it's question regarding the how the uh, cyber crimes and crimes are handled by the uh, government. 
during the pandemic? Correct, correct, Professor. Correct. Thank okay. You. So the the crimes relating to COVID is uh, what the uh, uh, first crime was that how uh, the mask manufacturers sold their products to others in a high price. So they had to handle that problem at the first time, and then uh, they the government gave a notice uh, uh, and also get the collaboration work of the, all the pharmaceutical uh, companies and also the pharmacy. All the pharmacy supposed to sell the mask given by the government at a certain hour. So people can get access to the mask at a certain time. And whenever they line up, they can get the mask. So controlling the mask was the first thing that the, the government has to control because the crime relating to COVID first thing was the relating to the mask. And then what happened is that people are having so many uh, uh, SNA shoppings. So they had to handle the uh, voice phishing and spam mails and those things. Here uh, during the weekdays, the, the crime slowed down but during weekends, where, whether when the, uh, the banks are closed and also the, uh, the telemarketers are uh, not working, the crime went up. Like uh, they're showing you the fake Facebook page and giving you the link that I'm selling this and you are buying it. So I actually are in the group of uh, fake uh, swindlers that uh, they are cheated by those people. So the government had uh, made uh, the telephone uh, track system that is called the cheat. And whenever the telephone number is registered to this the cheat site, then uh, you are trying to have uh, uh, any uh, uh, sales with that person, this uh, pop up message shows that this telephone number is the owned by the cheater. So you get to notice what the number means. And there are many uh, sites, uh, if I can just share the, my screen uh, for now. Uh, uh, here, uh, here, yeah. This one, uh, I can share the, my screen a little bit. Here, the numbers are 1,010. Uh, 1,110, these people are cheated people and sharing their how they have cheated and they share the information who is controlling how they got cheated and who is handling their, uh, what kind of police and what, uh, the, who is handling the, the case. These are the all information relating to the crimes during the COVID-19. So, um, this is a private uh, channel that we can handle the crimes. We also, uh, I'm in there to see how the, the crime relating to the site, site crimes during the pandemic going on. I'm inside to see how they handle it. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, I think we are now, yeah, thank you, ba Budi Vijaya and also the speakers. It was very wonderful and we are very having limited time. So I do apologize that I should end this session. And to conclude our session today, uh, I think we learned a lot of uh, knowledge about the country experience. Uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are now uh, protecting the cybersecurity and uh, how important the cybersecurity itself was described by Professor Sonny Zulhuda, that uh, there should be a very strong and powerful cybersecurity because now everybody use the internet for their daily activities, not only for education, but also for economic business activities and in multi-sectors. And Professor Budi Agus Rizwandi uh, mentioned that Indonesia has a very flexible uh, patent law system. However, there are so many obstacles that this must be the homework 
from the government side and also from the legislative members and also the authorities because the vaccine of COVID-19 is really needed in our country because we are the third or the fourth major population in the world and the COVID-19 victim is now increasing. So uh, uh, the vaccine of COVID-19 is really needed in Indonesia and this proposal from Professor Budi should be considered very well to our author, uh, authority body. And Professor Jihyun Park is really providing a wonderful, insightful presentation that South Korea passed 300 bills. I think this is more than Indonesia. Indonesia is trying to make omnibus law, try to simplify the law, but South Korea during this pandemic is trying to make 300 bills. It's only to protect the people. So South Korea government is not working individually as a government, but they also uh, making uh, the people, the society also contribute to, pre to protect and to prevent and to mitigate the COVID-19. I think we need to learn the culture, the system, the technology from South Korea as well. So I think next year I could visit you in South Korea. In, because I feel secure now, because you mentioned a lot of technology and so on. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for Professor Budi Agus Liswandi, Professor Jihyun Park, and then Professor Sonny Zulhuda. I think this is the time for us to do photo session. So I would like to ask Yuan and also the committee to provide a screenshot from the Zoom. So every participants, please, uh, open your camera and try to behave <laughs> and also wear your clothes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And do not open your sarung. <laughs> so we will do a screenshot and I will count from three to one, okay? So first, I think from us, from the speaker session. So try to smile. Pak Budi, Pak Jiyun, Pak Sony. One, two... Okay, I will remove the pin. Then, ready, you want and committee to do screenshot? I think for the first group, one, two, three. Okay, we go to the next group, groups two. Wow, we have 150 participants today. One, two, three. Yeah. Good, yeah. Then the next group. One, two, three. The fourth group. One, two, three. The fifth group. One, two, three. And the last group. One, two, three. So thank you very much for the speakers, the participants and also everybody, the committee for this conference. It was very nice discussion. It was very insightful and also wonderful presentation. So we do hope that it could provide us more experience and knowledge, additional knowledge for- Thank you, for, Yeah, thank Thank you, everybody. Yeah. You. Now I will give back thank the you, microphone to the master of ceremony because after this session, there will be, there will be uh, uh, awarding ceremony so you can stay tuned or you can leave it, it's up to you okay so please the master of ceremony you can start now and you can prepare and we will show you the video please, please uh, yeah. permit because I have class after this silakan silakan Pak Budi yes. Park and Prof. Sony and all. Yeah, Pak Budi, thank you. Till see you again. Thank you, Professor Park. Thank you, Pak Budi. Thank you, Pak Sony. You can leave or you can stay because there will be a wording ceremony after this. <laughs> I will be leaving and staying both. Okay. Now and off. <laughs> okay. No I will leave on and off. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. Konsolidasi demokrasi di Indonesia.
membutuhkan pilar-pilar hukum yang kuat, membutuhkan pendekar-pendekar hukum yang sanggup membawa Indonesia menjadi negeri yang kokoh dalam bangunan sistem hukum serta menjunjung tinggi keadilan. Kita harus bergerak meracik obat penjara untuk menyembuhkan tubuh hukum di negeri ini yang nyaris sekarang. Kita akan menemukan jejak-jejak para begawan dan pejuang hukum yang terus bertarung demi tegaknya hukum dan keadilan di negeri ini. Mari kita memulai ekspedisi. Inilah program studi hukum program sarjana Universitas Islam Indonesia yang terakreditasi A, PAN, PT, dan sertifikasi internasional dari ASEAN University Network on Higher Education for Quality Assurance. Program Studi Hukum Program Sarjana Universitas Islam Indonesia terdiri dari program reguler dan program inter... Nice by the Yongsan University of Busan in South Korea. Before I was selected to be one of the participants to get scholarship in this program, I did the interview with some of the lecturers in the Faculty of Law, in which the interview is using English language. I'm so excited to be here today and to have to be able to talk to um, our new students and our prospective students about the international program. My name is Chris Kaysen and I'm from America but I've been teaching here for three years. And I love teaching in the international program because I find these wonderful great legal minds among our students and have the opportunity to immerse them in international law, especially the critical thinking aspects and the problem solving aspects that we work on every day. I'm so proud because I have the opportunity to provide students with the experience of actually studying God and still being in the KPA Fakultas Hukum UI didirikan untuk mendidik calon advokat yang handal, yang profesional dan berintegritas, bertanggung jawab atas tugas dan fungsinya sebagai advokat. KPA Fakultas Hukum UI didirikan tahun 2004 hasil kerjasama Fakultas Hukum UI dengan DPN Pradi yang berkantor di CB. Hingga sekarang, PKPA Fakultas Hukum UI sudah menghasilkan lebih dari 3.900 orang yang berasal dari berbagai perguruan tinggi ternama di Indonesia. PKPA Fakultas Hukum UI mempunyai keunggulan 
unggul dalam penyediaan fasilitas perkuliahan yang modern dilengkapi dengan IT yang memadai, dilengkapi dengan tenaga-tenaga pengajar yang handal dan profesional yang terdiri dari para akademisi dan praktisi yang berpengalaman. Karena itu, bagi saudara-saudara yang sudah lulus Fakultas Hukum UII, apabila terpanggil untuk menjadi advokat, maka melalui PKPA Fakultas Hukum UII adalah pilihan yang tepat untuk mempersiapkan saudara menjadi calon-calon advokat yang handal, profesional, dan berintegritas. Fakultas Hukum Universitas Islam Indonesia memiliki dua program magister, program studi magister hukum dan magister kenotariatan yang ditempuh selama empat semester. Magister Hukum Fakultas Hukum Universitas Islam Indonesia adalah program magister pertama yang dikelola oleh perguruan tinggi swasta di wilayah daerah istimewa Yogyakarta dan Jawa Tengah. Fakultas Hukum Universitas Islam Indonesia menyadari kebutuhan para pembelajar hukum yang akan terus mengembangkan kajian-kajian teoritik secara mendalam dengan pendekatan-pendekatan yang canggih dan komprehensif yang disandingkan dengan kemampuan pragmatis untuk mendorong pembuatan kebijakan-kebijakan yang humanis. Di sinilah mahasiswa doktoral Fakultas Hukum Universitas Islam Indonesia tidak hanya digembleng dengan pemahaman normatif dan penelitian-penelitian doktrinal, akan tetapi mampu mengimplementasikan gagasan ideal hukum sebagai solusi bagi problem kemanusiaan. Saya Dr. Tabita Srijedi Sajana Hukum Magister Kenotariatan Notaris di Kota Yogyakarta, Notaris Koperasi, Notaris Pasar Modal, Pejabat Pembuat Akte Tanah Kota Yogyakarta, Pejabat Lelang kelas 2 daerah istimewa Yogyakarta Dan sebagai alumni S3 Universitas Islam Indonesia di kota Yogyakarta Saya sungguh bersyukur dan bangga menjadi alumni program doktoral Universitas Islam Indonesia Meskipun mungkin saya sebagai satu-satunya mahasiswi yang beragama non-muslim Berketurunan Tionghoa Tetapi saya merasakan kenyamanan, keramahan dan berinteraksi di dalam kampus ini dengan semua mahasiswa dengan baik Karena UII sangat menjunjung tinggi toleransi beragama Semoga ke depan UII semakin sukses dan jaya Dosen-dosen Fakultas Hukum Universitas Islam Indonesia Adalah para pendekar hukum yang tidak mau berpangku tangan Saat ketidakadilan dipertontonkan Yang tidak mau berdiam diri ketika kesewenang-wenangan Mengancam nilai-nilai kemanusiaan Untuk menunjang proses pembelajaran, Fakultas Hukum menyediakan sarana dan prasarana di antaranya Ruang kelas yang dirancang untuk perkuliahan interaktif, ruang-ruang laboratorium yang mematangkan beragam gagasan inovatif, ruang diorama, dan ruang pengadilan semu. Inilah ruang-ruang yang menjadi saksi pertarungan gagasan intelektual para calon master hukum. Jejak-jejak pengetahuan mengguris di setiap sudut dan dinding kelas. Dari sini pula gerakan-gerakan sosial untuk menggedor pintu kekuasaan diformulasikan. Ruang-ruang ini merekam beribu peristiwa yang terus menjadi tonggak perjuangan untuk membela kemanusiaan dan keadilan. Fakultas Hukum Universitas Islam Indonesia sedang mempersiapkan ruang belajar baru di area kampus terpadu. Sebuah gedung perkuliahan yang merepresentasikan nilai-nilai Fakultas Hukum Universitas Islam Indonesia tidak hanya menjadi ruang akademik, tetapi juga menjadi ruang bersama yang mempertemukan kebelbagaian. 
kajian-kajian hukum yang tumbuh dan berkembang di ruang-ruang kelas juga diperkuat oleh riset-riset mendalam di pusat-pusat studi di lingkungan Fakultas Hukum Universitas Islam Indonesia. Melalui pusat-pusat studi, mahasiswa calon sarjana hukum dapat mengelaborasi gagasan-gagasan mereka sekaligus mendapatkan pengalaman sebagai peneliti di bidang hukum. Dan inilah beberapa catatan tentang prestasi-prestasi yang ditorehkan oleh mahasiswa hukum Fakultas Hukum Universitas Islam Indonesia. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Membawa sebuah pencerahan, keilmuan, dan juga kebermanfaatan buat kehidupan bangsa dan negara. Sukses. Saya Imawan Mahyudi, Wakil Bupati Kabupaten Gunung Kidul. Saya sangat terkesan dengan kuliah di Fakultas Hukum UI. Dosen-dosennya memberikan perhatian sangat serius, eh, dipenuhi seluruh eh, jam tatap muka dan sangat berkualitas. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yang paling terkesan adalah iklim demokrasi, di mana para dosen membuka ruang perbedaan, mengajak kita berdiskusi, dan yang sangat penting adalah bagaimana membangun argumentasi atas perspektif yang kita gunakan. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Di kampus ini saya menemukan harmonisasi antara nilai, ilmu, dan juga integritas. Halo, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bagi saya, Fakultas Hukum UI adalah sebuah tempat di mana kita tidak hanya diajarkan untuk belajar dan menimba ilmu hukum, tetapi kita juga dibiasakan untuk melakukan sharing, berdiskusi, dan mengembangkan skill kita di bidang hukum melalui berbagai UKM yang ada di lingkungan Fakultas Hukum UI. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start, before we start to the next agenda, please open your camera. No, we are moving to into we are moving into the next agenda. The next agenda is announce the prize and award to all the competitors that has been participated in this conference. We also have the award announcement for the special lecture and special student with several categories that we that we mention on later. The announcement will be present by Mr. Rahardian and Mr. Faisal. To Mr. Rahardian and Faisal, the time is yours. Check. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. So let me to announce our list of award on International Student Colloquium 2020.
So. Tidak usah pakai ini aja, pakai ini. Oh, oh ya. Thank you. So we would like to announce the list of awards for International Student Collegium 2020. Please. Yeah, please, uh, please, you can share screen, committee. Okay. The first, we will announce for IP body this IP body is a program from international program, undergraduate study program in Lao, Faculty of Law, Universitas Islam Indonesia, to accompany the foreign student to attend in the class. For committees, please. Okay. So, the first winner for IP body is Mr. Farhan Fevionaldo. For Mr. Farhan, please come forward. Please, ba Bagia, uh, to give a uh, the word to up. For the second place of IP party is going to Miss Agustina Zahrotul Jenna. Yes, uh, unfortunately, she's not here. To Mr. 
Bagia and Mr. Farhan, please take place for presentation. Thank you. You may be seated. So, we would like to inform you that the second uh, award is for favorite lecture. And the favorite lecture for 2020 is Dr. Idul Rizhan SH LLM. Unfortunately, he's not here right now. Oh, and from the committee, we have the information that he will receive the award from home. Thank you. And then for the, for the most favorite staff in international program, Faculty of Law, Universitas Islam, Indonesia. For Ms. Novera Widyarani. For Mr. Bakia. So we will have trophy from Mr. Bagia to Ms. Novera. Next is the most favorite present present staff in international program, Faculty of Law, Universitas Islam Indonesia. Let me welcome Mr. Ronnie Mindardi. Please come forward. For Mr. Dodi Setiawan, please come forward to give the trophy for Mr. Ronnie Mintardi. Oh, special request from... Yeah, we have this special uh, request from the International Program Secretary that Mr. Ronnie Mintardi will give one uh, praise for speech. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih teman-teman atas penghargaan yang diberikan kepada saya. Semoga ini menjadi semangat saya dan untuk teman-teman presensi, kalau kami menyebutnya tim admin, admin kader kuliah. Terima kasih teman-teman. Thank you, Mr. Rani. For the next nomination, the most active student in the class and organization in International Program Faculty of Law, Universitas Islam Indonesia. The most active student is going to Mr. Akhirudin Shah Putra Lupis. Please, Mr. Bagia, to give the trophy to Lupis. For the next nomination, we have student source 
of Inspiration in International Program Faculty of Law Universitas Islam Indonesia for Miss Putri Arika please come forward but unfortunately she is not attended here maybe Putri will say something from there from home Putri yes sir yeah say something <laughs> Uh, I don't know what should I say, sir. I just want to say that thank you very much because honestly, I'm not believe that I not believe that I was elected to be the student source of inspiration, sir. I think that's all, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The next nomination for the Kalma student in International Program Faculty of Law, Universitas Islam Indonesia, is going to Celia Afwa Isnan. Please, Celia, coming forward. Please, Mr. Bagia, to give the trophy. Thank you, Celia. The next nomination for the funny student in the International Program Faculty of Law, Universitas Islam Indonesia, is going to Anwarul Muarif. Please, Anwar, coming forward. Please, Mr. Pragya, to give. The trophy. And now we are going to announce the winners of the best participant. The first best participant is going to Anissa Aulia Putri. Hello. Unfortunately, she, she will speak something, I think, from you. Anissa? Hello? Oh, she's not here, okay. Miss Anissa, please say uh, some speech from the Zoom. <laughs> Thank you for the committee. Oh my God, I don't believe uh, this award is going. Uh, I was chosen for these awards. Uh, thank you for all the committees. The conference are great and superb. Thank you. For the second place is going to Frances A. Dufy. Say something, Francis. You are the second best participant. Are you there? Can you unmute Francis? Can you find Francis account? Okay. Francis, can you unmute? Hello? Can you say something? Okay, you may continue. Yes, for the third place is going to Muhammad Sulhan. Yes, please Sulhan coming forward.
Please, Mr. Bagia, to give the trophy. Yes, thank you. And now we will have the fourth best participant. It's going to Mr. Wildan Amrila Amrani. For Mr. Wildan, please come forward. To Mr. Bagia, please to give the trophy to Mr. Well done, and we will have the picture session. We're still waiting for the, from the committee. And now we are going to announce the best paper awards from this International Student Colloquium 2020. We're going to the, the third place. We have Mr. Yuan Zahlul Ismail. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Mr. Yuan Zahlil Ismail. To Mr. Begia, please to give the trophy to our winner, our third place. For the second place is going to Mtias Wisni Aufa from International Islamic University of Malaysia along with score 82. Please Miss Mtias if you're available on Zoom meeting say something. Uh, yes, thank you very much to first of all my partner uh, Miss Izia Nazim uh, and to all the committees and participants. Thank you. We will send your trophy to your home. <laughs> and then for the first place of the best paper is going to Putri Arika from Universitas Islam Indonesia with score 82.25. To Ms. Putri, please say something if you are available on Zoom. Uh, uh, firstly, thank you because again and again, I'm not believe that I was elected to be the first <laughs> best paper. Thank you. I think that's all. Okay, thank you, Ms. Putri. And now for the next nomination, we will have the best presenter award. On the third place, we will have 
Mr. Avan Maulana from Universitas Islam Indonesia with score 18. To Mr. Avan, please come forward. And for Mr. Bagia, please come forward to give the trophy for the third place. For the second place is going to Miss Safira Dewata Putri from Universitas Pendidikan Nasional Bali with score 95. Please Miss Safira, if you're available on Zoom meetings, please say something. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the important aid that has been given to me. And I would like to thank you also to all the com 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 committee on duty, I'm so sorry. Um, that's all. Thank you for me. And for the first place of best presenter, we will have Ni Hajar from International Islamic University of Malaysia with point with score ninety five point five. Thank you. For Ni Ajar, you may say something. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I'm very happy for the opportunity given. And I hope that there will be more activities like this in the near future. So thank you so much. The nomination has ended. Now I will turn to the master of ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, now we are at the end of these occasions. We are so glad to become the part of this event, especially everything was run well as planned. Thank you to all the guest speakers. Thank you to all the lecturers. Thank you to all the participants. Thank you to all the committee. And thank you to all the participants. Hopefully, we can see each other in another occasion. If there is any mistake and inconvenience, we would like to sincerely apologize. And once again, thank you. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Konsolidasi demokrasi di Indonesia membutuhkan pilar-pilar hukum yang kuat, membutuhkan pendekar-pendekar hukum yang sanggup membawa Indonesia menjadi negeri yang kokoh dalam bangunan sistem hukum serta menjunjung tinggi keadilan. Kita harus bergerak meracik obat mujarab untuk menyembuhkan tubuh hukum di negeri ini yang nyaris sekarang. Kita akan menemukan jejak-jejak para begawan dan pejuang hukum yang terus bertarung demi tegaknya hukum dan keadilan di negeri ini. Mari kita memulai ekspedisi. Inilah program studi hukum program sarjana Universitas Islam Indonesia yang terakreditasi A, BAN PT, dan sertifikasi internasional dari ASEAN University Network on Higher Education for Quality Assurance. Program Studi Hukum Program Sarjana Universitas Islam Indonesia terdiri dari program reguler dan program internasional. Kurikulum yang kami desain 
berorientasi pada lahirnya figur-figur sarjana hukum yang berintegritas dan profesional. Untuk menjadi seorang sarjana hukum, mahasiswa hukum Fakultas Hukum Universitas Islam Indonesia harus menyelesaikan sebanyak 147 SKS. Agar merasakan langsung peran seorang praktisi hukum di dunia kerja, mahasiswa hukum Fakultas Hukum Universitas Islam Indonesia wajib mengikuti program magang yang terdiri dari magang mandiri dan reguler. Untuk mengasah jiwa sosial yang berlandaskan nilai-nilai keyuian, mahasiswa hukum Fakultas Hukum Universitas Islam Indonesia diwajibkan menjalankan KKN. Metode pembelajaran di Fakultas Hukum Universitas Islam Indonesia terdiri dari media pembelajaran luar jaringan atau luring dan dalam jaringan daring. excited to be here today and to have to be able to talk to uh, our new students and our prospective students about the international program. My name is Chris Kaysen and I'm from America but I've been teaching here for three years. And I love teaching in the international program because I find these wonderful great legal minds among our students and have the opportunity to immerse them in international law, especially the critical thinking aspects and the problem solving aspects that we work on every day. I'm so proud because I have the opportunity to provide students with the experience of actually studying abroad and still being an individual. KPA Fakultas Hukum UII didirikan untuk mendidik calon advokat yang handal, yang profesional dan berintegritas, bertanggung jawab atas tugas dan fungsinya sebagai advokat. KPA Fakultas Hukum UII didirikan tahun 2004 hasil kerjasama Fakultas Hukum UII dengan DPN Pradi yang berkantor di CP. Hingga sekarang, PKPA Fakultas Hukum UI sudah menghasilkan lebih dari 3.900 orang yang berasal dari berbagai perguruan tinggi ternama di Indonesia. PKPA Fakultas Hukum UI mempunyai keunggulan, unggul dalam penyediaan fasilitas perkuliahan yang modern dilengkapi dengan IT yang memadai, dilengkapi dengan tenaga-tenaga pengajar yang handal dan profesional yang terdiri dari para akademisi dan praktisi yang berpengalaman. Karena itu, bagi saudara-saudara yang sudah lulus Fakultas Hukum UI, apabila terpanggil untuk menjadi advokat, maka melalui PKPA Fakultas Hukum UI adalah pilihan yang tepat untuk mempersiapkan saudara menjadi calon-calon advokat yang handal, profesional, dan berintegritas. Fakultas Hukum Universitas Islam Indonesia memiliki dua program magister, program studi magister hukum dan magister kenotariatan yang ditempuh selama empat semester. Magister Hukum Fakultas Hukum Universitas Islam Indonesia adalah program magister pertama yang dikelola oleh perguruan tinggi swasta di wilayah daerah istimewa Yogyakarta dan Jawa Tengah. 
Fakultas Hukum Universitas Islam Indonesia menyadari kebutuhan para pembelajar hukum yang akan terus mengembangkan kajian-kajian teoritik secara mendalam dengan pendekatan-pendekatan yang canggih dan komprehensif yang disandingkan dengan kemampuan pragmatis untuk mendorong pembuatan kebijakan-kebijakan yang humanis. Di sinilah mahasiswa doktoral Fakultas Hukum Universitas Islam Indonesia tidak hanya digembleng dengan pemahaman normatif dan penelitian-penelitian doktrinal, akan tetapi mampu mengimplementasikan gagasan ideal hukum sebagai solusi bagi problem kemanusiaan. Saya Dr. Tabita Sri Jedi Sajana Hukum Magister Kenotariatan Notaris di Kota Yogyakarta, Notaris Koperasi, Notaris Pasar Modal, Pejabat Pembuat Akte Tanah Kota Yogyakarta, Pejabat Lelang kelas 2 daerah istimewa Yogyakarta Dan sebagai alumni S3 Universitas Islam Indonesia di kota Yogyakarta Saya sungguh bersyukur dan bangga menjadi alumni program doktoral Universitas Islam Indonesia Meskipun mungkin saya sebagai satu-satunya mahasiswi yang beragama non-muslim Berketurunan Tionghoa Tetapi saya merasakan kenyamanan, keramahan dan berinteraksi di dalam kampus ini dengan semua mahasiswa dengan baik Karena UII sangat menjunjung tinggi toleransi beragama Semoga ke depan UII semakin sukses dan jaya Dosen-dosen Fakultas Hukum Universitas Islam Indonesia Adalah para pendekar hukum yang tidak mau berpangku tangan Saat ketidakadilan dipertontonkan Yang tidak mau berdiam diri ketika kesewenang-wenangan Mengancam nilai-nilai kemanusiaan Untuk menunjang proses pembelajaran, Fakultas Hukum menyediakan sarana dan prasarana di antaranya Ruang kelas yang dirancang untuk perkuliahan interaktif Ruang-ruang laboratorium yang mematangkan beragam gagasan inovatif Ruang diorama dan ruang pengadilan semu Inilah ruang-ruang yang menjadi saksi pertarungan gagasan intelektual para calon master hukum. Jejak-jejak pengetahuan mengguris di setiap sudut dan dinding kelas. Dari sini pula gerakan-gerakan sosial untuk menggedor pintu kekuasaan diformulasikan. Ruang-ruang ini merekam bersih. Fakultas Hukum Universitas Islam Indonesia Rapi, juga menjadi ruang bersama yang mempertemukan kebelbagaian. Kajian-kajian hukum yang tumbuh dan berkembang di ruang-ruang kelas juga diperkuat oleh Indonesia. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Membawa sebuah pencerahan, keilmuan, dan juga kebermanfaatan buat kehidupan bangsa dan negara. Sukses. Saya Imawan Mangis. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Di kampus ini saya menemukan harmonisasi antara nilai ilmu dan juga isi, antara nilai ilmu dan juga integritas. Biasakan untuk melakukan sharing, berdiskusi, dan mengembangkan skill kita di bidang hukum melalui berbagai UKM. Yeah, yeah, yeah.